Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, I've been testing a lot of Intel Z590 motherboards recently, namely for VRM thermal performance, and this has allowed me to take a look at how each board's configured out of the box. For the most part, Z590 motherboards run 11th gen processors without any enforced power limits, which is perfectly fine and within the loosely defined Intel specification. I found that Z590 motherboards from ASUS, MSI and Gigabyte all run without power limits or at least limits that will heavily restrict the performance of parts like the Intel Core i9-11900K. Depending on the motherboard, the 11900K will boost to and maintain an all-core frequency of 4.7 to 4.8 GHz. However, ASRock follows the Intel base spec, which is commonly referred to as the TDP specification. So, that means the 11900K will boost up to 4.8 GHz for a period of up to 56 seconds before dropping down to 4.3 GHz, where it runs at a package power of 125 watts. So, for sustained core-heavy workloads, ASRock Z590 motherboards will clock 11th gen CPUs around 10% lower than that of boards from competing brands. Still, ASRock is operating within the Intel spec, they just happen to be using the minimum specification, whereas ASUS, MSI, and Gigabyte are all using the maximum specification. So it's a bit of a mess really, but at the end of the day, doesn't make too much difference for the Z590 motherboards. We're only talking about a 10% frequency discrepancy for sustained workloads. And while that's certainly not nothing, the performance margins in core heavy applications are typically gonna end up being pretty small and then virtually non-existent in today's games. However, the focus of today's video isn't Z590 motherboards, but rather B560. As it stands, these new B series boards make a lot more sense as they now enable memory overclocking, and with K-SKU processors being somewhat pointless due to the extremely limited overclocking headroom, locked parts like the 11400 offer the most value and therefore make the most sense. Now, there's little point in pairing a locked Intel CPU with a Z series motherboard, especially at a price premium. So therefore, I've decided to shift my focus towards finding the best value B560 motherboard, and what a frustrating journey that's proving to be. In fact, I found it so frustrating that I had to stop the testing for the video I was making, and then change gears and make this video, uh, a video to warn you guys of the possible pitfalls when buying a B560 motherboard. What I've discovered is quite alarming and something all potential Intel buyers really need to be made aware of. In short, depending on the B560 motherboard you buy, performance of locked 65 watt parts like the 11400 and 11700, they can be negatively impacted by over 30%. That's right, we're not talking about parts like the Core i9 11900K, but rather processors you'll likely pair with an affordable B560 motherboard. Prior to this testing, the only B560 motherboard that I'd looked at was the MSI B560 Tomahawk, as it was the only board that I could get at the time of testing the Core i5-11400F, and the performance was identical to that of the Z590 motherboards that I'd already used for testing from the likes of ASUS, MSI, and Gigabyte. MSI even told me that it was to be expected that B560 motherboards would offer the same level of performance as their Z590 counterparts. But as it turns out, that's not always the case. Far from it, in fact. Using the B560 Tomahawk, the 11400F sustained the same 4.2 GHz all-core frequency that we saw on the more expensive Z590 motherboards, and therefore performance remained exactly the same. The Tomahawk, though, is a $200 US B560 motherboard, so it's hardly cheap, and therefore the results were really as expected. I then tried out the Gigabyte B560M Aorus Pro AX, it cost $180 US, and again, it mirrored the performance previously seen with the Z590 motherboards. So what I really wanted to know was, how well do the cheaper boards handle parts like the 11400 and 11700? After all, you can run a Ryzen 9 5950X without any performance restrictions on a $110 AMD B550 board like the Gigabyte B550M DS3H and MSI B550M Pro VDH Wi-Fi, for example. So I went out and purchased the ASRock B560 Pro 4, which costs $125 US. I also have the MSI B560M Pro, which should be priced closer to $100, and then the Gigabyte B550M DS3H AC, and I'm not entirely sure what that model will cost. Then I have the higher end Gigabyte B560M Aorus Pro AX and MSI B560 Tomahawk boards that I've already spoken of. 
Now, I fully expected entry-level B560 motherboards to run high-end parts like the Intel Core i9-11900K with power limits in place, so the 125 watt TDP. What I wasn't entirely sure about was how they'd be configured with 65 watt parts. Take the Core i5 11400 for example. I did expect that it would be possible to run the Lock 6 core processor without any power limits in place to achieve maximum performance, and technically it is. So here's a look at how these motherboards perform out of the box using the Core i5 11400F. The $200 Tomahawk and $180 Aorus Pro AX performed as expected, delivering a score of roughly 10,000 points in Cinebench R23. And this is because both sustained an all-core frequency of 4.2 GHz out of the box. It's also worth noting that this frequency is sustained indefinitely, providing sufficient CPU cooling of course. And we see that after 30 minutes of looping the multi-core test, the score remained much the same. Now the ASRock B560 Pro 4, Gigabyte B560M DS3HAC and MSI B560M Pro all enforced the 65 watt TDP limit by default. But that doesn't mean the same thing for all boards. In fact, all three were different. Due to slight variations in voltage tuning and the efficiency of the board's VRM, the all core frequency does vary within that 65 watt envelope. The B560 Pro 4, for example, ran the 11400F at 3380 MHz, and that meant out of the box the Tomahawk and other B560 motherboards that don't enforce the power limits are clocking the processor 24% higher. But the ASRock board wasn't even the worst. The MSI B560M Pro clocked even lower at just 3100 MHz, more than 1 GHz lower than the Tomahawk, which clocked 35% higher. Then we have the Gigabyte B560M DS3HAC, which maintained an all-core frequency of 3500 MHz, so 13% higher than that of the MSI B560M Pro. What this means is, for all core workloads, the B560 Tomahawk is 27% faster than the B560M Pro. Actually, it's worse than that. The clock frequencies just mentioned were recorded at the end of the 30 minute stress test. So if we ignore the first run where the B560 boards aren't running the entire test at the PL1 power state, and look at the results recorded after 30 minutes of looping the test, we see that the B560 Tomahawk is actually 35% faster than the B560M Pro. That's an incredible performance difference, and really we are talking about a different tier of CPU performance. The kind of difference you'd normally expect to see when upgrading from a 6 to 8 core CPU of the same architecture. Now for those of you focused purely on gaming, the difference isn't as significant, at least in most games that don't max out the 11400F. Testing with Shadow of the Tomb Raider shows just a 12% uplift from the B560M Pro to the Tomahawk. That's still a reasonable difference, but it's nothing like the 35% margin we saw in the Cinebench R23 benchmark. Now, it is possible to remove the power limits and unleash the full potential of the 11400F on these entry-level B560 boards, and how you go about doing that depends on the motherboard. Some are easier than others. In the case of the MSI B560M Pro, you simply change the cooler option in the BIOS from box cooler to water cooling, and providing you have sufficient CPU cooling, it will boost up to 4.2 GHz for the all-core workloads. So you might be thinking, well, if that's the case, then what's the big deal? I'd say with the Core i5-11400F is really just more of a nuisance than anything, and it'll catch out the inexperienced users who will struggle to work out why their system isn't performing as claimed by reviewers and other users running better boards. It's a bit of a mess really, but it will get much worse should it come time to upgrade. The next logical step for those seeking a little extra processing power would be a locked version of the Core i7-11700, and this is where things go very wrong. Again, we see that the Tomahawk and Aorus Pro run the 11th gen processor without power limits, clocking the 11700 to 4.4 GHz, which allowed for a score of just over 14,000 points. The cheaper B560 boards, though, weren't nearly as impressive. The Gigabyte B560M DS3HAC dropped the clock frequency in this test to 3180 MHz, then the ASRock B560 Pro 4 sustained just 3155 MHz, and the MSI B560M Pro 4 was the worst of all at just 2890 MHz. Incredibly, that meant for the sustained workload, which saw Cinebench loop for 30 minutes, the Tomahawk was 43% faster than the B560M DS3HAC, and 44% faster than the ASRock B560 Pro 4. That is nuts. But it gets even worse. If you were to buy the MSI B560 Tomahawk with a Core i7-11700, 
rather than the MSI B560M Pro 4, you'd have done well, gaining 53% more performance out of the box. Again, the impact on gaming performance really will depend on how CPU demanding the game is. In this example, the Tomahawk was 14% faster than the B560M Pro, 9% faster than the B560 Pro 4, and 8% faster than the B560M DS3HAC. Now, if we once again remove the power limits and allow the Core i7-11700 to run at full speed, just as we did with the Core i5-11400F, things don't exactly go to plan, and this time we run into a bit of a showstopper, motherboard VRM performance the very thing I set out to test. The MSI B560M Pro 4 can handle a package power of 125 watts pretty well, but going beyond that sees the board run into trouble, forcing it to throttle the CPU in order to avoid catastrophe. Without power limits in place, the 11700 will push package power up to around 140 watts, depending on the level of voltage used by the board. So, removing the power limits on the MSI B560M Pro with the 11700 installed resulted in VRM thermal throttling, and while this did see the average clock speed raised to 3.8GHz, so a 900MHz boost there, the frequency did dip down to 800MHz when throttling, and that makes for a pretty horrible experience. It also means, even if we ignore the VRM throttling issues, the 11700 still clocks 16% higher on boards like the Tomahawk. The Gigabyte B560M DS3H AC didn't avoid throttling either, though it did only periodically dip down to around 2GHz, though that is still out of spec, and it meant the average frequency achieved was 4.1GHz, so 300MHz shy of the target. Interestingly, the ASRock B560 Pro 4 didn't VRM throttle, but still only managed 4.3GHz with the power limits removed, though that is only a 100MHz deficit. The crazy part being that all boards worked significantly better out of the box with the 125 watt Core i5-11600K clocking no lower than 250 MHz below the 4.6 GHz all core frequency. The reason for this is actually due to the higher TDP, 125 watt up from 65 watt. So there's less need to remove the power limits with a part like the 11600K as you're only gaining around 200 MHz for heavy all core workloads so less than a 4% drop in frequency. So locking these boards at 125 watts seems like the way to go when using parts like the 11700. You still won't get the maximum amount out of it, but you'll get very close while avoiding VRM throttling. So if you're willing to do a little tinkering with the power limits, you can manually dial most of these boards in pretty well. But the point is without some fairly knowledgeable user intervention, the platform is a mess for budget builders. The fact that out-of-the-box performance can vary by up to 50% between B560 motherboards when using the same processor is absolutely insane. And we're not even talking about one board partner screwing up here. This one is squarely on Intel. We could bash MSI for making the B560M Pro 4. And if we did, we'd also have to go after ASRock for the B560M HDV or Gigabyte for the B560M Power or even ASUS for the B560M-P. All of those boards will suffer from the same issues and there's likely even more boards further up the stack. Having said that, technically all of these boards do meet the Intel specification, the base spec or TDP spec as it's often referred to. So for their entry level boards, each board partner has ensured that the VRM can handle the power requirements of the Intel base spec, and that's about it. Essentially they're OEM motherboards, or rather should be OEM motherboards. Even the MSI B560M Pro, which clocks the 11700 as low as 2.9 gigahertz, is within Intel's incredibly loosely defined spec. That's because the 11700 has an official base clock frequency of just 2.5 gigahertz. So as long as the clocks don't drop below that, it's within spec. We actually only ever went out of spec with the power limits removed as this reduced the base clock under load to 800 megahertz due to VRM throttling kicking in to save the board from thermal runaway. In the case of the Core i7-11700, we had boards that sustained load frequencies of 2.9 gigahertz right up to 4.4 gigahertz and Intel will tell you that they're all running within spec. Of course, this entire mess has been caused by Intel's struggles to move from their 14 nanometer process. The loosely defined TDP spec wasn't really an issue back in the KB Lake days when all Intel offered was a four core eight thread processor in their mainstream desktop lineup. But as they started to add more cores without major corrections to the TDP figure, we saw the gap between the base and boost clocks continue to widen. 
For example, the 65 watt Core i7-7700 saw just a 17% disparity between its base and boost clocks. Then with the 65 watt Core i7-8700, that figure increased to 44%, and now we're at a ludicrous 96% with the Core i7-11700. So this is the mess we're faced with when recommending locked Intel CPUs on budget B560 motherboards. The fact that with some of these boards you can successfully remove the power limits and receive the expected level of performance, or very near to, not really the point. The point is it's a minefield for buyers. It's a case where buying the wrong B560 board can mean a huge decrease in performance, and it's not always easy or even possible to recover that performance. So my job now, as I see it, is to work out just how little you can spend on a B560 motherboard and still achieve maximum performance with parts like the Core i7-11700, ideally without having to manually remove or fine tune the power limits. I guess essentially what we want is the out of the box experience boards like the MSI B560 Tomahawk or Gigabyte B560M Aorus Pro offer without having to pay $200 for the privilege or very near to $200. Whether or not that's possible does remain to be seen, but I will have the answers for you guys shortly in an upcoming B560 VRM benchmark, which will cover many more boards than what I had here today. Until then, my advice is to avoid sub $140 US B560 motherboards. They don't look like they're going to end up being a terribly good investment. But of course, I will have much more info on that soon. If you found this video useful, then please give it a like. You can also subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to support the channel more directly and get some cool perks in return, we have Floatplane and Patreon. We spent quite a bit of our Floatplane Patreon money to create this video. I had to buy the locked processors. Intel refuses to provide those. Uh, maybe we know why now. Not sure on that one, but these weren't particularly cheap, especially the Core i7 model, so I bought that. 11400F, which we've already reviewed, and a couple of these motherboards. So over $1,000 Australian worth of hardware for this video. So yeah, we very much appreciate our Floatplane and Patreon members that make uh, content like this that we can't look at without uh, some extra cash because we have to buy the products because motherboard manufacturers don't typically want to send out low-end motherboards. And for unknown reasons, Intel doesn't like to send out their locked processors, the processors that many of you are very interested in. Anyway, if you do sign up, you'll get access to our exclusive Discord chat, monthly live streams, Q&As, a lot of cool stuff there, so check it out if you're interested. But if not, perfectly fine. Just like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.